Looking back, uh, the movement to bring the Holodomor out of the shadows had its most active and productive decade in the West during the 80s, being also the decade of commemorating the 50th anniversary of the Holodomor. As you can see, here are some major um, uh, products of that time. Of particular significance to today's overview, the 1980s saw the appearance of the first fully developed guides for teaching of the uh, uh, Ukraine famine. Uh, and I will also say that in the final report submitted to Congress in 1988, it included in the summary this is very significant because it's one of the first times that we start hearing of it in public, is 1988, the resounding declaration that Joseph Stalin and those around him committed genocide against Ukrainians in 1932. And the other aspect is that, you know, the commission was really instrumental uh, to the, you know, getting education going in the United States. It says, thanks to the initiative of commission, and this is actually within the text of the executive summary, it says, thanks to the initiative of commission member Dr. Midon Kotopas, curriculum development became a major focus of commission efforts. Uh, in order to better provide information to educational institutions, the commission produced a teacher's guide to the famine, which was introduced in 1986 at a teacher's conference in Chicago. Uh, so as stated in the 80s, um, these were some of the major um, guides that came out at that time. The Code of Pass in the front, um, and the New York State one that was mentioned, and this is the one that came out of um, uh, Massachusetts and Connecticut. All of these curriculums, you know, were carefully prepared and they used, you know, the, the best teaching practices of the day. Um, but each was written prior to the breakup of the Soviet Union and Ukraine's independence. And that context has, context has changed, and the whole Demore must be presented within a different framework and uh, it's a show of different spheres of relevance. Plus, in those days, you know, those curriculums assumed that you had at least five to ten sessions worth of time. As, um, and I think, you know, you probably agree that that's highly unlikely, you know, in this day and age. After the heyday, as you will, uh, if you will, of the 80s, uh, the topic of the Holodomor in the diaspora became secondary to the expectations and euphoria evinced by the emergence of an independent Ukraine in the early 90s. In Ukraine, on the other hand, um, you had a, a great resurgence of scholarly and political interest in the previously unmentionable topic of the famine. So the resulting wealth of research based on newly accessible archival documents and on thousands of new survivor accounts and survey results created a growing base of published documentation that served to provide solid proof to the groundbreaking work of the 80s. In academia, it stimulated a renewed level of interest among Western scholars who previously glossed over the early 30s and only considered the purges and eventually the gulags as, shall we say, excesses of Soviet rule. This was all good, but didn't necessarily trickle down and translate into the realm of high school or even undergraduate education. You know, just, just take a look at the textbooks, even, even to today. What I wanted to point out that uh, one significant development was a discovery uh, less than 10 years ago of Raphael Lemkin's speech on the Ukrainian genocide by Professor Unchak of, uh, in the New York Public Library archives. <coughs> And with Professor Serbin's uh, a subsequent extensive promotion and related writings, the concept of the famine as genocide received considerable added impetus and support. Numerous conferences and exhibits appeared on college campuses and public arenas. arenas. Several new documentaries were released, both in Ukraine and in the West. Uh, also, renewed interest in teaching appeared, inspired at least in part by the possibilities of new technologies. Because after all, the advent of the World Wide Web only occurred like 20 years ago. And, you know, we can see now how this has, you know, exploded our access and share, sharing of information today. This is the first uh, new curriculum guide to appear in the U.S. besides Kudapas's revision of his own guide. 
Authors uh, Bay, Mirchuk, and Schwed collaborated on presenting a fresh 21st century approach on teaching the Holdemore that reflects both the pedagogical concerns of today and technological potential. Uh, the workbook succeeded in presenting the essential information about the organization, execution, and deception surrounding the Holodomor in easily digestible segments. Unlike the curriculum of the 80s, it could be presented in a few sessions, perhaps as few as two or three, if only a selection of the possible worksheets are include, included. Mrs. Bay indicated to me that the curriculum was presented at a conference both in Pennsylvania and North Carolina, and she commented that she still gets emails from teachers telling her how much they liked using her resource. Now, Kudapasa's next slide uh, update is kind of like a crossover between the 80s and the present. Although the text and the standards related material matter has been updated, the format has not, and the presentation does not take advantage of new technology options. Next slide. Now, another uh, Chicago-based product takes a totally different approach. Using the widely accepted framework of Stanton's Eight Stages of Genocide, this guide attempts to do an even-handed side-by-side -side comparison of several genocides with the Holy Demor as the teaching example. Uh, from the low level of detail uh, and carefully limited vocabulary, it seems like it's geared toward, you know, grades, say, six to nine. As a concept, I think it demonstrates both how easy it can be to fit teaching the Holodomor into a genocide study unit. On the other hand, it also shows the pitfalls of applying a one-size-fits-all framework. Um, for upper grades in particular, oversimplification of the Holodomor for purposes of fitting the models can be misleading. Also, I'm thinking that this, if this is used for a class period of, you know, say, one or two periods, you know, as a quick overview, teachers might want to ask students to select one genocide to do a particular project on, and so you would hope that they would be more references, you know, included, you know, with, with the curriculum. Uh, only uh, the Dalit's execution of hunger is included, which is in keeping all the, all the genocides represented with an autobiographical um, uh, resource. But on the other hand, and this is something that, you know, you, you can share, maybe the assumption was is that, you know, uh, Students will instead use one of the mega research reference self-contained databases that are now available in the school, such as Gale's InfoTrack and so on. So maybe that's been, you know, we don't get resources, go and do the research in InfoTrack. Um, overall, I like this curriculum uh, because it provides an example of another way to present the whole of the more. By using the Stanton framework, it makes the inclusion of the whole of the more in a genocide program an easier fit. However, a more robust and nuanced treatment of the whole the more within this framework should definitely be developed for use in high school and beyond. As Oksana mentioned, we have this wonderful uh, new uh, PowerPoint presentation, which appears to be the first educational PowerPoint produced in the U.S. devoted exclusively to the whole the more. A PowerPoint presentation, by offering concise highlights along with visual interest and the flexibility uh, as needed, to stop whenever you need to, to add additional information, gives this uh, one advantage over a film. It has 42 slides, including a workshop, a worksheet, excuse me, and a list of resources for further study. It's very easy to follow, and the uh, well-written addendum fills in details that are not uh, available on the PowerPoint. And speaking of visual teaching resources, we are very fortunate now to have Yuri Luhovi's Genocide Revealed Educational Release DVD. Um, I know this wasn't created in the U.S., but I feel it has to be mentioned. Um, and either length can be incorporated into genocide and human rights studies, 20th century European history, political science, and other areas of instruction. It is especially effective when paired with one of the teaching guides that we've discussed here. Um, and something that the producers may want to consider <coughs> And that is to work with a whole demor education, perhaps somebody in this audience, to create a supplementary study guide to go with the film, and perhaps even make that study guide uh, fully available online and even free. And that, I think, would be a way to also promote the film. This is uh, the product that we developed in Connecticut. Um, it is a classroom-ready lesson plan uh, and resource package 
the Holodomor, China's Great Leap Forward Famine, the Darfur Crisis, and selected current events are case studies for recognizing, acknowledging, and exposing human rights violations and genocide with a special focus on media and social um, responsibility. So it's a very different approach. Um, it does not focus on proving that the Holodomor is a genocide. The second edition explicitly follows Stanford's Stanford University's Reading Like a Historian model. I don't know whether any of you are familiar with that, but it's available on, online uh, and, and excellent to, to use. Um, there's also, next slide, there are also three fairly popular type things that you can uh, use that are available online. Uh, they don't provide instructional guidelines with them, but they are easily accessible. Now, much of the focus in the last couple of day, decades has been to prove how the Ukrainian famine fits the defini definition of genocide, um, particularly from a political and legal perspective. This has been the subject of various research papers and has trickled down to educational materials. Ukraine, as a newly independent nation, is constructing its historical narrative, as all nations do, in a way that defines itself and its relationship with foreign oppressors and present-day neighbors in a meaningful way. Typically then, from a political and legal perspective, we try to prevent, present proof uh, about the genocide, the nature of the Holodomor, in a rather formal and academic manner regarding evidence of intent, strategic and political actions at various party levels, categories of victims, and technical similarities to the Holocaust. We use a context of political history and say little about the pre-Holodomor life and work of the people that constitute that unfamiliar, undifferentiated, economic abstract of humanity, humanity which we sometimes incorrectly call the Ukrainian peasantry. For the sake of academic conformity and expedience, we ourselves, by default, and quite unintentionally, I have to say, have downplayed the individual humanity of the very people we wish to honor and remember. We can go to the next slide. I'm just, we'll just, I'll flash through some slides. We have uh, books. Of, these are uh, for the older students. And I, I'm personally very uh, crazy about the stones under the scythe. Uh, because, um, for one thing, uh, it, just to summarize, under these simple yet almost Socratic discussions with his wise benefactress and his own youthful soul searching present some of the most thoughtful yet down to earth writing in what it means to be a caring human being under the most inhuman circumstances. And it does present both the village perspective and the city perspective, which is rarely seen in, in our uh, uh, material and for younger readers. These are shorter works, you know, either chapters or um, um, in chapters and so on. So I won't get into that either. But in conclusion, uh, this is the, our, our, in our Armenian example uh, that is a very worthwhile um, uh, model that we could use for doing creating some of our own units of study. Uh, this is uh, a from a Cambodian bystander segment in, in a Gale uh, genocide database. And again, it gives an example of how you can nuance you know, the presentation of this information. What I think we need to, uh, to really focus on is how we make our content, that how we make our content relate to other genocide studies how we make our content relevant within a broad range of subjects, and how we make our content compelling are important factors in how successful we will be in having our stories heard and accepted. So much I wanted to say. <laughs>